Hey everybody, welcome back to the quest for the bestest from Backlog Banter. I'm Timo, I'm joined this afternoon by Tucker, Tanner, and Abram, and today we are talking about the 1936 uh, musical movie, The Great Zigfield, directed by Robert Z. Leonard. It's a musical of sorts, I don't know, Tucker's mm. giving me an, an iffy look about that. Um, we'll get into it. We're gonna get into what this movie has to say, and what I have to say about this movie. But first, Whoa. we gotta talk about what we did last week. Last week we had another musical. Um, and we really liked it actually, except for me. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was good, but we decided to rank it at number nine because the we had movie some, being Chicago, the movie being Chicago. Sorry. But That'd so, be nice for people to know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, okay. Ninth place out of 22 movies, um, had some glowing reviews. It was overall a very enjoyable movie. Um, yeah. and, and pretty fun to talk about, but that might change ever after we start talking about William Powell, Myrna Loy, Luis Rayner in The Great Sigfield. It's a biopic. It's like a biopic before they thought of how to make a biopic. The mm -hmm. very first biopic to win Best Picture, and boy, did it set a precedent that I hate. Yeah. Yeah. This poor, poor movie is going to get trashed today. And it's not a little subtle thing yet. We're already kind of showing our hand a little bit. Yeah. Backlog Venture subtleism, the classic subtleism that you're used to on this show, not here today, folks. Just going to let you no. know. The film Sorry. gave us a little bit of a taste of its magic when we pulled up the letterbox page last week and we looked, and it has the runtime. It's 176 minutes, which is four minutes shy of three hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For you and math viewers out, out there. <laughs> you know me, Mr. Math. Um... And oh boy, did I feel the runtime. I, yeah. I had to, I never split movies. I had to split this movie. I had, I couldn't do it in one sitting. Yeah, I, I was I was waiting the whole week to make fun of you for doing that. Cause because I, I know how much shit you give me for watching things in chunks because I've <laughs> I have a pretty low attention span, all things considered, and, and I do like watching things in, in chunks. Like I like doing things while I'm watching movies. And, and this one I told Tanner we were about an hour into it. I'm like I'm, I'm drifting off. It, it was late at night. All things, uh, yeah, it was also late at night. So I was like, okay, I'm drifting off. I want to give this movie my attention. So we came back fresh in the morning and finished it. And, yeah. and actually, I think that probably helped us a little bit, being able to uh, absorb it a little bit better, yeah. um, considering that we did give ourselves an, an unintentional intermission. But, but uh, if we can get into, if we can get into the, the weeds, the details, the specifics of this film, we actually stopped right after... Uh, I, I know this is something that we wanted to talk about. We brought this up earlier. We stopped watching right after... The notorious and infamous milk scene. The milk yeah, bit. Milk the lengthy milk okay. bit. Yes. Uh, and uh, much like many of the other scenes of this film, is it comedy? Is it is it supposed to tell us something about Ziegfeld's character? Is it supposed to tell us something about the other people's characters? Or is it just in there to lengthen this movie to a gross degree? I think it's probably that last option. <laughs> So what I said about this movie is that it's it's when your teacher asks for a 10 page paper and you have yeah. like six pages of material. So you gotta stretch it out. Yeah. You now, have six I, pages you have six pages of material and like ten million dollars to blow on something extravagant. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This movie blew some blew some money. Yes. And and I think it's put to good use because I don't think this is a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination. What I think it is, is a film that is way, way, way too long. It, it needed somebody to come in from the outside and edit down a lot of this film. Because mm -hmm. I think that there is a lot actually uh, that, that redeems this film, a lot in terms of production design, a lot in terms of choreography. I think this is some actually really interesting dialogue exchanges and character beats. But it's just... It's stretched out so thin that I was reminded a lot of actually The Last Emperor, another film we reviewed sure. here um, when I was watching it, because uh, this film, like The Last Emperor, I could appreciate, but I found myself being really bored by it. But I think the difference is The Last Emperor had a lot more to say in a lot more of a pointed fashion mm -hmm. than, than this film does. Yeah. I will say yeah. The Last Emperor didn't quite bore me, but this film did. Yes, yeah. I think it, I think Abram hit the nail on the head there, in that the Last Emperor had something to say. What did, what in the world was this film trying to say? What was its message? What was its themes? What was the point of it all? So I uh, the, I think the film. If we want, I want to get into this. I was thinking about this as it wrapped up, and as the last, you know, the film. So the film ends with the stock market crash of twenty nine, right? Um, yes, yes. Where the Great Depression. we're going into the Great Depression, where every, everyone loses everything. They're ruined. They can't. They're not going to be able to make anything. 
And mm -hmm. what it reminded me of is I've seen some other films of this era, particularly the the Gold Diggers of 1935. Is mm. is this movie? But it's way better. Um, ah. <laughs> it's it's like an hour and fifteen minutes, and it's just the crazy extravagant dance sequences, and it's great for it. And it, it, that movie is really good. I highly recommend mm -hmm. you check it out if you find yourself sort of tickled by this. But it's escapism in the purest degree that's what this is 1936 when this movie came out you were in the throes of the depression you got world war ii coming up although they don't know it yet well they probably some some people could probably guess who's coming up but i mean what are you gonna do there's no jobs there's no money and so what better than to spend three hours watching a light-hearted drama comedy with some just flat out insane and expen like obviously very expensive um sequences and so yeah. for me that's where it's like I, I don't know about the themes i don't know about like the the like whatever the the point is not related to the film at all is entirely contextual the point of the film is to sit there and watch something that is far better than your real life for yeah. three hours it yeah. feels like actually if i if i can it, it's almost like the 30s version of jurassic park and what I mean by that is you spend okay. a lot of time in your film classes learning about how Jurassic Park and, and how it was basically a showcase of CGI and the strength of that film is you're, you're in the theater and you're sitting there to watch something you can never believe. These, mm -hmm. these dinosaurs seem so crazy and that really becomes the hinge of the film. I mean, Jurassic Park is a little bit more engaging than this is, but the hinge of that film was its CGI. And, and I think obviously the reason you would want to watch this back in the day are for those big numbers because like mm -hmm. Timo said there, they're, they really are incredibly choreographed, and especially like that. I, I'm not even going to pretend to remember the sequence, but the big spiral. That, you know, I, yeah. as as that one. I mean, um, it, it was like a one take, right? Let's talk about that one because that yeah. was just like. Let's talk, let's talk about that scene. Uh, so that it is the it is the it is titled the "A Pretty Girl Is Like a Melody" scene. That's the song that they're singing. Okay. That okay. is the scene that won. Don't remember that. Best, really. Best dance direction at the Oscars. Okay, I can see why. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. I think it deserves that, yeah. The the like the production design, the set, and then just you know the sheer length of it. You you have limitations. You know your film roles can only last yes. so long. Oh, and yeah. and uh, I I do have a bit of a, a copied bit of IMDb trivia. If you'd okay. like me to read that, I off. would I would sure. like to know. Yeah. Uh, the sequence "A Pretty Girl Is Like a Melody" was filmed in two lengthy takes after several weeks of rehearsals and filming. Parentheses: A definite cut is made when moving to a close up on the singer dressed as. Pagliac Pagliacci, Pagliacci, I believe. Yeah. Presumably to affect the change of camera position necessary to start the inexorable move up to the huge inexorable move up the huge staircase. It features 180 performers and cost $220,000. <laughs> I did the conversion. I did the conversion. That is $4.2 million on one scene. Okay. Well, you can feel it. You can feel it. 4,300 yards of Royan silk were used for the curtains in the scene. 4,300 yards, to put in context, that is 43 football fields. We, we, we spent a long time talking about the goddamn curtains that they put yeah. in, front of that, in front of that scene. Not only is there a curtain that descends around it as it's finishing up, but there's mm -hmm. this one gigantic curtain that, that, that like draws up to reveal it. Yeah. Exactly. And, and we were just sitting there thinking, like, what, what do they do with that when they're done? Where, is it? Where does it go? Where, they need a warehouse just for that damn thing. When, it, <laughs> when it's folded up, how tall is it? Like, Huh? <laughs> what's what's the use? But I think that is probably indicative of why this movie received the claim it did at the time. I think actually mm -hmm. Timo talking about it being uh, produced in the Great Depression and not only being in that era, but people in that era being more uh, used to watching movies for a long period of time. They would stay in movie houses all day. They didn't have anything else to do. And this movie not only provided one long thing to sit down and, and watch but it provided a form of escapism i think a lot of people from the area era didn't have the chance to do this was this was rich people stuff they were seeing filmed on screen like mm -hmm. they, they maybe had seen people in burlesque calls or, or i think you know people dancing but this was where all the money went and i think that that puts it in a certain place that we're never going to be able to recapture yeah um and it, it obviously for us, you know, we're looking at it more of the lens of okay, what's the character? What are the characters like? What's the story? What are the themes of the film? Because that's how we've grown up appreciating film. But for the an era where films were a lot a lot shorter, they were a lot simpler. Sound was relatively new at the time. All of this culminates in something that's like, holy shit! I can't believe they did all this. I can't believe it's all on screen. 
on top of that being about a person who was in the era very influential very important for entertainment so this is like watching a, a, a spielberg bio, biopic for our day like everyone knew zegfield everyone knew about zegfield's follies and zegfield girls stuff like that so sure okay. see i i see where you're coming from but i think i want to actually bring back up jurassic park again though because you mentioned mm. spielberg and i'm here for it just in the way that when you watch Jurassic Park now and that CGI is a lot less impressive, I, you can contextualize why these big set pieces would have been fun. But from the modern perspective, just like how that CGI has aged, these have really aged because they're boring. <laughs> and I think, I think actually this is, I, I personally found this to be the weakest part of the film because unlike mm. Chicago, where we were talking about how musical numbers interface with narrative well narrative ends for literally yes. 12 to 15 minutes it's of just, very simple camera work and and dancing yeah. it's the yeah. proscenium I, arch you know the total like you don't really get the 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 three-dimensional aspect of a musical performance in there i yeah. see what you're saying i actually made i actually made a note that while watching it. it's very interesting that we're watching this coming off the back of chicago where it's, mm -hmm. you know, a modern movie musical that's almost like throwing back to this era of stage performance and like putting a modern twist on yeah. it for modern audiences versus someone, a film that was made much closer to the time where, the, where those are popular. Yeah, well, also, also just to think about, I think all the performances are diegetic. There's no, those are all real yeah. performances going on that we are just watching being captured. They're not like the, the alternate reality um, musical numbers that we see in sure, Chicago yeah. and we saw in West Side Story. They are just actually just a performance that we, along with the in-movie characters in the audience watch, we're like part yeah. of them, which maybe adds to the feeling of being able to experience the hoity-toity rich Broadway scene. Because like, oh, I'm watching yeah. this and I, oh, there's the guy with the fancy top hat that's shiny. I've never seen a shiny <laughs> top hat before. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I did find them just on novelty to be interesting though. So, so I didn't find them boring. I, they got old because as Abram said, yeah, it, do, it does take a block of like 10, 15 minutes in the middle and just gives you a straight like variety show that the big one, the big one with the big cake was interesting. The physical comedy of that one guy doing like a tap dance routine was sort of interesting, but Black otherwise... Face. Yeah, well, there's there's some blackface in this movie, which it's a product of his time, uh, but that doesn't excuse it. Still yeah. bad. Don't hey folks, in, in, in case you need me to tell you this, don't do blackface. It's a bad yeah. idea. Yeah. Uh, well, I like to get educational on these on these shows. So, <laughs> but thank, yeah, thank so, you, Professor uh, Tanner. Out, outside of those, outside of those performances, I think Abram is correct in calling these. You know, they're a little dull, especially for modern audiences. Um. Do, is there anything else about the performances that we want to get into? Because uh, well, for I'd like me, to... you were talking earlier about sound. And for me, the performances was a really interesting mix of music and sound and then the, the, the lyrics as dialogue, you know, whatever. Mm. I thought that that was actually really well done. I mean, the, the, the way that you could hear everything was intelligible. Everything was like seeming like flowed seamlessly. And at times they pulled out and were not in the, um, See, not in the performance, and they were flowing back in, and so like the just the sound mixing and and all that stuff was very good, in my opinion, for you know for the time, and um and I don't know, help helped sell it, helped me feel like it was part of the, you know, I was part of the audience watching the performance. I just liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I guess I I I made a note of this as well. I guess I don't. Really, I didn't really feel what made the the shows such hits, such a thing, to the point of which you needed to, um, that you needed to make a biopic about this guy, and that's a, a really a larger critique of an issue that I have with this is that okay, so basically Zigfield's character operates in a cycle. He has a great idea. Well, he comes across a performer that he'd like to spotlight. He usually steals them away from Billings. In most Poor cases. Jack Billings. Poor Jack, Poor Jack Billings. Billings. He, he steals him away. He has He's a great idea. The entire portion of the movie. <laughs> yeah. He has a great idea. It go, it does gangbusters. Then it sort of just it fizzles out, and he goes broke somehow. Well, he goes and buys the women a ton of diamonds and furs and mink coats and whatnot. And then he runs out of money. Yeah, and then he's and broke again. Happens. And then he's broke again. And then he has to discover a new star. Yes, this happens. And that over happens. And over three to four times in this in this three-hour film mm -hmm. and 
I don't know. Like the first time it's initially it's interesting because it is an interesting cycle for a character, I guess, especially because that first half of the film really operates more as a co- more as a comedy. Whereas when Zegfield is getting older, it doesn't operate as much as a comedy anymore. I don't know what and it operates as in the second half, to be honest. Maybe maybe that's the point. Maybe we're supposed to see like how how sad it is that this man has to, that this man lived his career in this cycle. But uh, I, I also I also don't know how accurate that is historically. I don't so. know either. The only I, I saw a Zigfield's Follies film and it was just about the like first Zigfield's Follies. It was like a yeah. like a dramatization of that and just like them coming together and making the production and whatnot. Well, yeah, that's the thing is that if this analyzed like maybe his first one or his last four when he just suddenly makes four hit Broadway shows at the same time. If it zeroed in on one of those moments in his life, it'd be much more interesting. It, yeah. could, it could actually get into why those were hit shows. We don't see him coming up with like, what if we did a five-story cake in the middle of the of the stage, and there was people singing all around it, and there's a woman in a giant fairy godmother dress at the top. We don't see him coming up with any of that. Yeah, so it just it's happens. All, it's not it interesting. It, it'd be more interesting if we if we saw it come to fruition. If we saw it spring from his mind much like athena from the mind of zeus damn (laughs) this is why the runtime is so weird because i totally agree with you tanner i was told i was expecting almost like the zigfeld corleone fall in the second half of this film it never really comes because the film becomes very cyclical with okay we're going to move from woman to woman from folly to folly but we're not going to really delve into them and when zigfeld finally falls it's a function of the stock market yeah we, we, he said, yeah he like many other people just like invested in the stock market and then it crashes Shoot. and that's why he and then he he actually died in 1933 i remember reading that somewhere so yeah so they kind of dr- dramatize the ending there but i guess so yeah i need i need more steps <laughs> yeah <laughs> Is that, no, but, is that line symbolic of something in his character, in his character arc in the film? Well, that's that's the one thematic element that the film tries to carry through is this sense of wanting more and needing more, not being yeah. enough. We need more, but it's never, he never goes into it and he never fails until the film ends. You know, he never has yeah. to confront He's always just, He always just gets lucky again. And then yeah. I guess yeah. maybe you could say that it's also because the film, uh, you know, features so much extravagance. That's that feels more like an operation of the film and not of the characters in the film. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to talk about characters, there are positively so many characters and just so many <laughs> women that I, oh, I, I can barely keep them straight. Yeah. Tucker, so, did you have something to say? Yeah. I got plenty to say. I got okay. plenty to say. Bottom mouth over here. But so I th- one thing I think is interesting is I kept feeling throughout the film, thinking back to themes, fi- uh, films like chicago like shakespeare in love that that take this introspective look on on industry and how it affects people and like the cycles of that and the the background production of it and this story is technically about the volatility of the theater production industry but you don't really you don't really see that and i kept trying to grab onto that and hoping for them to delve a little bit deeper into it and see how it impacted his character and these women that he was working with who most of them just ended up disappearing after after he uh didn't wasn't put, putting his focus on them anymore and i felt like there could have been so much more interesting stuff there but well i do think that the film was character wise carried by by um william powell who i think did a fantastic job hey, he's a good performance florence ziegfeld mm-hmm. uh oh. and and i have seen him in uh he's a, he's the star of all the thin man movies him and myrna loy um they did like 21 movies together something like that the, the two of them as the top build stars mm-hmm. um but i think that his character from a writing perspective wasn't engaging enough for me to feel like it warranted this this epic quote unquote yeah because when you get a three-hour runtime for a movie and you're getting a godfather getting a last uh last emperor say last of us that's not right um <laughs> <laughs> you can only hope you expect the course of their life and to see them really grow as a character but unfortunately as you guys were saying the cyclical nature of of florence ziegfeld jr uh just didn't really lend itself to a character arc it was a character corkscrew it was a it was a character wow. uh what's a corkscrew yes. noodle i don't even remember the specific name for that but um no, wait, no that's just a straight one no yeah that's a two Rigatoni. No, I always just call it Cavatappi. That's what it is. <laughs> I Tapioca. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But I get what you're saying, Tucker. Yeah, yeah. It 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 does feel strange in it's not like going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, I think it has a strong start. Him having that conflict with Billings. They're in the uh, circus sort of area. He's got uh, sand out. Yeah, yeah, the world's, world's fair. fair. They're, 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 he has sand out. He's trying to figure out how to like grow his business. I think that that, that was all really interesting. Unfortunately, they didn't take that anywhere um, and, and and instead focused more on the extravagance, more on how can we pull people in the 30s, put their butts in their seats to, to get the greatest show they've ever seen put on screen, um, which they did do that. I mean, for all things considered. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. It, but I'd also like to posit that people were really fucking stupid back in the 1930s. <laughs> Much stupider than we, than we are currently now. Uh-huh. Here's, here's what, what, what was fascinating to me, because I'm, I've just been trying to think back to the film as we're talking. Do you remember when Ziegfeld faked a fight between the strongman and the lion, and then the police were chasing him, and then that gets dropped. Do you remember when he has a weird relationship with a small girl who grows oh, up? thank you for and reminding him, me. And then it, she leaves the film. There is so much well, that she happens comes back. that has she no She comes back later. No, but then she oh, yeah, leaves. And said. then she leaves again. Yeah. 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 The film has so much that happens that it feels like it should be very consequential. Ziegfeld takes police resources to find three random men, <laughs> and then there's a threat of a lawsuit, and nothing. Like, hey, happens. you can't do that. You, the police are gonna get angry at you. Those guys are gonna get angry at you. And he's like, actually, the movie's about ten minutes from being over, so nothing's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no consequences. No, there really isn't. Yeah. There's really and no and stakes. I think, and I think that's also pretty apparent in what's what's technically his his final romance with his wife uh billy played by myrna loy who doesn't show up till two hours and ten minutes into the movie yet she's yeah. second build and she barely has anything to do with the story um but his relationship with anna held far more interesting yeah that was very interesting developed yeah uh she's far more interesting of a character but unfortunately she's dropped halfway through i mean by Here's virtue of him moving on yeah. but the 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 re- relationship that the movie i think wants you to herald around which is myrna loy and william powell this classic uh movie hollywood couple that well they weren't married but um at least i don't think they were they might have been um, the jennifer lawrence and bradley cooper of their time but what i'm saying is i think they <laughs> they put the butts in the seats by saying okay look they're the, these two classic stars coming back they're they're having this romance i mean epic but that that is never developed I, I I did not like the relationship. They have a yeah. child. They build this gigantic home. They have like twelve servants working for them, but that just comes out of nowhere. Like literally, she stumbles into his life and he he worms his way to, into her loving her. But aside from that, you don't really feel any passion between them, and it seems really really convenient. And I I found that yeah. pretty frustrating. Um, another thing. Speaking of relationships, we wish were fleshed out. Uh, Zigfield and Billings. Yeah. There are these two men who have known each other since the beginnings of their careers, and they're somehow in the same industry, and they're always like trying to undercut. Well, I guess only Zigfield really is undercutting Billings. Billings is always Billings is doing the hard work of like actually scouting talent, and then Zigfield is just like, actually, I'm gonna marry that actress. So, so you, you can't can work with her. Well, yeah, and then Billings is the one putting up the cash all the time, and he's just yeah. like he's just, like unquestioning he's, money yeah. multiple times. <laughs> Without question, and that's so that's the weirdest part because I felt like there is some kind of narrative and thematic movement yeah, behind some, Ziegfeld, like a friend of me, like their friend, yeah, sure. kind of, and, but it, that never comes to fruition. It almost no. does when it almost does when they're like when he's like consoling him on his deathbed, but then I, I don't I don't know. It, he's he just walks away and he's like. Uh, they really foil. I'm, I'm trying to remember the line, but they really foil like any interesting setup he had there, because he's like, like you. It'd be interesting if he said, "I'm gonna lend him the money," uh, and he walks away. And then is that before the stock market crash? It is, right? Yeah. It's after. Yeah. After. Okay. yeah it's after. He's, oh, he's got his gray hair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because he, yeah, he walks away. And he's like, actually, I don't have the money. Well, that speaks to the fact that this movie either should have been an hour and a half long or six hours long because <laughs> so much happens in, in these three hours, even though it's not useful to anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, I, it, we, I mean, 
thinking at it from the screenwriter's perspective, it's all construction so that you can get those numbers. So you can get that four <laughs> point however many million dollars in today's money, you know, yeah. 15 minute scene. That's 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 why it's in there. Um, Although, I mean, there there are funny moments. Um, I think Aldous Sandow is a great character. He's really he's he always was interesting to watch um, when he's on screen. I think mean, he's like flexing, and the women come and touch him, and he's like kind of not okay with it. Like you can tell through his performance. Um, and then the, the you know just the way Ziegfeld like kind of is always tricking everybody. He's like, oh, you got to bathe in milk, Anna held, and that's how the everyone's gonna think you've got great skin. You know why do people? Th- why are you going through twelve hundred gallons of milk a week? Well, it's because you're like. It's just kind of weird, but it's also kind of funny. Um, and I think there are like individual moments like that interspersed throughout the first two thirds of the film, and then the last third is not so funny. Yeah, mm-hmm. I I do think that um, it's it's things like that that do I think prove what Tanner was sort of talking about earlier, where he was he couldn't really feel why Ziegfeld was so important, why they, why would they want to make a biopic about him, but I I think they they. Put that in a backseat to sort of talk about his personal life more, but they they didn't really talk about his personal life that much. But they did show these things like people sitting in the audience or or people discussing like entirely random strangers who are like getting the haircuts of the Folly girls. They wanted to be in the Follies. They were taking the milk bath. Like he clearly had huge cultural impact, but because we just kept seeing him be so successful, be so successful, and create these shows, create these shows, and then fall down. We didn't really feel the widespread impact of that, which I think is the reason they made this biopic, the reason it's it's interesting at all, the reason that uh, it has any enduring you know meaning to this day is because that was a real person with real theatrical influence. Yeah, well, they, they made a move, what, three years after his death? I mean, he would have completely been still in the uh, cultural zeitgeist of the time, and so they would have... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that you have, a, you have a reasonable point there, but you can also just kind of say that, well context has sort of been lost to time oh 100 exactly yeah i mean none of us would have known who that was before i mean you you'd seen i'd seen Zufield's one Follies, other, but yeah I, I i don't think that the three of us i don't think we could have told you what industry watching, this movie was going to be in like <laughs> i love watching zigfield follies reruns on youtube i didn't know and i still wasn't sure when we began recording <laughs> if he was a real person yeah he was a real person okay yeah yeah, from my perspective, I had no <laughs> idea. So the context was definitely gone for me. Yeah, so, sure. well, the movie did a great job of convincing you of that, huh? Yeah, I mean, I did some research afterward on my own time um, about uh, the production of the movie. I looked at the trivia. I watched a short documentary in which they interviewed um, the actual uh, Anna Held and uh, also Ziegfeld's daughter. And they talked about how they dramatized some parts and they... Um, we're, we're pretty true to most of the things um but that i think in the end everyone involved was very happy with the final product um i just think because we're three generations disconnected from that it, it kind of loses its impact for us he is portrayed as a charming generally well to do you know well he's got good intentions he just wants to make his shows i think as, as a char- character and in the time i i would see no reason to be upset with how he um is portrayed yeah sure. um if i quickly want to rattle through its its wins and noms here mm-hmm. one best picture and one best actress for louise rayner who fun fact uh won best actress the next year after that for a movie called the good earth in which she played a chinese woman uh she is german she's not french which she is in this movie um but say so there's there's a you know classic hollywood disconnect there yeah. of things that probably shouldn't happen um but she did win back to back which is interesting uh, it won for Dance Direction, which we already talked about, which I do think it was deserved. Uh, it was nominated for Best Story. Yikes. What, what does that even translate to today? Original screenplay? I don't even know. I guess so. A Best me. Director for Robert Z. Leonard, which, you know what? Sure. I, I think... You had to think of all... Well-directed. You know, yeah, overall. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Production design, well-deserved. Honestly, I don't remember. I don't know what won, but should have probably won. Um, and uh, also nominated for Film Editing. No, no, thank you. Uh, but I mean, all things considered, not nominated for a lot. If, if you really look at the scope of what other movies have been nominated for, yeah. Um, I'd like to. I'd like to just shout out uh, one one little interesting note that I made. 
Uh, do you guys remember those things in elementary school when your when your teacher was trying to get you to like recognize patterns in the curriculum or whatever? And it'd be like, uh, the sun is today as the moon is tonight. Sure. You guys sure. remember those things? I yeah. have here, uh, elephants are to the great Ziegfeld as oranges are to the godfather. I remember seeing you type that on your phone. <laughs> because, yeah. There are, there are Flo, in there. Flo Ziegfeld has, has an elephant motif that yeah. he really enjoys. He really well, loves the, those the elephant gave him his initial burst of good luck, which carried him all the way through his death. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm missing one yep. vote, and then we can uh, tally it up and um, figure out where this movie goes. I have a hint because I've received the other three. But one individual. If you want, yes, if you want me to vamp, if we're talking about elephants, for a long time, longest time, I thought that elephants would just suck water up their trunks, but it turns out they use it like a hand to bring it to their mouth. Speaking of, we have our own little elephant motif in this episode. We do. Oh, shit. Abram's got a poster of a colorful elephant spraying some watercolors up in the air, and I really hope, because his trunk is lifted, we're going to get good luck. Yeah, a okay. delightful little photo. I have done the math, and I have done it's the calculations, and thank you to one individual, I actually had to do the math, because <laughs> the three of us were agreed, and one was not. We're, we sit at 22.75%. Oh. Percent. Oh. <laughs> well, then you don't really need to do the math. <laughs> I need to know the exact number. So, me, Abram, and Tucker put it at 23rd, and Tanner actually thought this movie was better than From Here to Eternity. He put it at 22, so I had to do a because little I math. Did, I did enjoy parts of it as opposed to... I did enjoy parts of The Great Ziegfeld as opposed to uh, From Here to Eternity. Mm-hmm. Well, this film made me like From Here to Eternity more. This film made me wow. like everything well, up on our list more. From Here to Eternity is actually pretty good, so... <laughs> hmm. Well, we can beat Tucker. At least we can be in agreement that it, From Here to Eternity is better than The Great Ziegfeld. Oh, is it so? It's it's going at the very bottom spot then. Yeah, going at the very bottom. Three of us put it at bottom spot. I didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, we're rounding down. Okay, J- good to know. Good to know. So how is how is we've done it? Okay, great. Yeah, math. You know, I, for all you math doers out there again. Math doing <laughs> doers. <laughs> Those are the people of the week. Yeah, people saying, we, our math doers. We salute you, our math doers. Okay, that was interesting. I mean, I I think we don't have a whole lot more to talk about. Um, no. You know, I'm not sure I would recommend it. Would you guys recommend this to the, the everyday no. viewer? Uh, there's probably definitely some better early Best Picture winners than this one. Yeah, and we're going to get to them. Okay, well, I think it's time we find out what next oh. Best Picture winner we will actually, have. Actually, I have one final oh. thing to say. Okay. is I actually think that this was a very interesting conversation for a lot of reasons. Obviously, we didn't really like it, but I wouldn't say we were we were shitting on it the whole time we, we were we were praising it for its its uh strengths in the time but we were no- noticing that it didn't really connect to us today and obviously we didn't really like it very much we put it at the very bottom mm-hmm. but um I, I think it's interesting to get such a different best picture winner because this one unlike i'd say 90 percent of the other ones we couldn't really talk about themes because this one was so thematically vapid we're so yeah. so focused on themes and characters um in a lot of our best picture winners but when we get one that is more focused on extravagance and scale and uh and choreography um i don't know i just i just think it's interesting to get something so different um tonally from the other ones and it gave us the chance to have a different kind of discussion i think you're very right yeah and it it it, it is an interesting movie to think about especially when you think about the context and i mean i probably would go and sit and watch this for a couple hours um if i had nothing better to do you were born 100 years ago yeah if i was born 100 years ago i probably would you know that's just how it goes Okay, Tanner. <clears throat> Jesus Christ. Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Give us a movie that makes us squeal. Is it on digital or is it on real? Wheel, wheel, what is your deal? And with that, we got the number 61. Oh, oh another old one. Let's fucking go, oh. boys. <gasps> oh, God, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Okay, he's, all right, 1938. 1938. We okay. got Gene Two Arthur, later. Lionel years... Barrymore, James Stewart. This mm-hmm. is Frank Capra directed You Can't Take It With You. You Can't this Take oh. It With You is absolutely phenomenal. I cannot wait to watch this. This is where things get a little bit wild because for my world cinema class, I just watched the 1937 film, like this would have released in 37, Pepe Lamoco. And I actually really liked it. It made me realize that I might like films from this era. So now there's some high stakes because this film came out the same year as that one. Mm. What's gonna happen? 
It's going to be the one-two punch no. to turn Abram into an antique film enjoyer. Yes, average antique film enjoyer. No, but I do think that this this film will have some strengths that I think might help point you in the direction of, of enjoying a larger scope of, of movies. Um, Frank Capra, classic guy. Are you kidding me? I love Frank Capra. The, this range of actors, you get a, a young Jimmy Stewart in here. Holy shit. This, yeah. this movie's great. I can't wait to watch all. Oh, oh. An interesting thing is that You Can't Take It With You is a play to begin with. So I want to see how this is, is transformed into a film. And I've actually seen a production of You Can't Take It With You at a local huh. playhouse here in Austin. So um, I want to know how they make it into a movie and how they use the movie, the filmic elements, to make it even better. Because mm-hmm. film, film is better than theater. I hate to admit you're, you're totally oh, right. Wow. That's a big call. And I don't know if we're going to get any any theater enjoyers in the comments to disagree with you. But Well, Mr. Keyboard Warrior, I've been practicing my typing speed. I will gladly have a cordial debate about the values of film Correct. versus theater. Um, that was very interesting. Glad glad we had this chat about this movie. Yeah. And I, Tucker, you, you've hyped me up. I'm excited to watch this movie. You can't take it with you. Um, luckily, oh, it's, it's just about two hours long, so we won't be, we won't have any oh, issues yeah. with watching Woo. it in more than one sitting. And so yeah. that's, it's going to be great. Thank you all for joining me. You've been listening to The Quest for the Best is from Backlog Banner. We've got a YouTube and a Twitter and a Letterboxd. If you want to find the updated versions of the list, it's there. And, uh, and we will be back next week. All right. Peace. Ziggy, 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 can't you see? Sometimes your words just hypnotize me, but not for three goddamn fucking hours. My aunt has a, my aunt has a deadbeat boyfriend and no kids. So <laughs> one of us one of <laughs> Pretty sure he has the same email address as me because sometimes I'll check my junk mail and I'll have random emails from MILF dating websites addressed to my email. Uh-huh, you don't, you uh-huh, don't understand. Uh-huh. You don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand. I checked in on like the first time I got one was back in high school. I checked in on it. I had my profile had a profile picture and the location was set to Gilbert, Arizona, which is where my cousin lives. <laughs> You're you're outing yourself as a less interesting Tanner in your family though, because you're not even a milk <laughs> yeah, hunter. I, I think he has CrossFit too, so he's way cooler than Bro, me. Bro, what a lot of things today. I'm learning.